You bet. I've got the preparing to live stream. Done redirecting. All right, when you're ready. Okay, great. Hi, I'm Paige Sharp with the Indiana Arts Commission. Welcome and thanks for being here today. I'm in my early 50s with sandy blonde shoulder length hair and I'm wearing a green dress. I wanna introduce you to our speaker today. I'm a big fan of hers. Elaine Grogan Luttrell, founder of Minerva Financial Arts is a CPA that specializes in working with artists and arts organizations. She loves working with creatives and has helped thousands across the country connect financial decisions with creative goals. And she teaches our on-ramp creative entrepreneur career accelerator. She's also the author of Arts and Numbers. We love her here at the IAC and I'm thrilled she's here today to help you make your project budgets shine. Elaine? Thank you so much, Paige. Um, I love the IAC uh, very much as well, and it is a pleasure to be joining you all here today. Um, my goal is for all of you to get all of the grant money possible to continue doing the really wonderful work you do. As Paige mentioned, my name is Elaine. I use she, her pronouns, and I am a 40-ish Caucasian female with hair that is longer than normal because I haven't had it cut in a while. Uh, it is wavy and blondish brownish, and I am wearing a black jacket today. I'm joining you from just north of Columbus, Ohio on Kashkashkia and Hopewell Indigenous lands. And as Paige mentioned, I have the very great privilege of working with creative individuals and organizations all across the country, uh, which definitely makes me the luckiest money professional anywhere. Um, and I am incredibly fortunate to be doing this work. This particular webinar is educational in nature, uh, so definitely make sure you are not relying on this for tax, legal, or accounting advice. But since we're talking about budgeting, none of those things should probably be an issue today. What are we doing specifically? We are going to review some best practices for creating an arts project budget, specifically related to the APS grant. We're going to review expense eligibility and match requirements and some key definitions that come up when you are applying for grants. And then we'll spend some time talking about connecting the budget to the project overall and highlighting some key outcomes and community engagement. So we wanted to start with kind of the why behind why we put together these budgets. Our why for our time together is to build your confidence when it comes to submitting a project budget, but then also to give you some tips to really make the budget shine and communicate the great work that your organization is doing. And in thinking about kind of why we apply for these grants, the funders typically identify a handful of kind of key problems uh, that end up wasting your time and you do not have a lot of time to waste. So we wanted to start by kind of reviewing those and just planting them in your brain to make sure that we can go through them. I will share as well, we are going to be taking questions at the end of the webinar. So definitely make sure to put any questions you have in the chat so that we can address them at the end. So the first key problem we often see is a problem with rules or objectives. So sometimes people will submit a budget that includes ineligible expenses or that doesn't follow the parameters of the grant, which means it cannot be funded because it doesn't align with those rules and objectives. And the funders spend a whole lot of time talking and thinking about what those right rules and objectives are. And not every grant is right for every organization or every project, but you definitely wanna make sure you're reviewing the eligibility so that you are putting your time and energy toward the applications that really make sense for you. For the APS grant in particular, the primary objective of the APS program is to provide the general public access to arts opportunities, which is a fantastic objective. And within that, the funding priorities are for quality arts activities with special attention to underserved communities and also support for local or Indiana artists. And I wanted to make sure to call this out because as you're thinking about putting your budget together, 
you want to make sure it's reflecting support for local artists and also quality arts activities with attention to those underserved communities. All of these definitions are contained on the IAC website, and you'll see I have these uh, website links linked at the bottom of the slide. I should mention as well, you'll be getting a copy of this slide deck after this presentation. So if you want to follow up with some of these resources, that's probably a good idea. But since we know what the objective is and we know what the funding priorities are, we want to make sure we're incorporating those into the budget. So what does that mean you should be doing? In terms of key actions, definitely take the time to review all of the requirements in detail. And I would do this at least two times. I would do it at the very beginning when you are thinking about completing the application, but then I would do it at the very end with a careful eye toward everything you've put together to make sure you haven't accidentally included an ineligible expense or something that would disqualify your application for some reason or cause the funder to come back to you with some extra questions. It's also worth remembering at the beginning kind of what's the objective of this particular grant and how can you make sure what you're proposing aligns with that as clearly as possible. You wanna make sure every expense you're including is eligible. And I will remind you that the funders, particularly from the Indiana Arts Commission, so the program's primary contact or the regional manager, are here to help. And so if you have questions or you want to kind of talk through your idea, it's not a bad idea to call these individuals and talk through what you're thinking because they can provide additional insights and clarity around some of the eligibility and objectives that might help as you're going through this process. The next problem that sometimes comes up is this idea of alignment, where what you think you're describing isn't actually coming through in the budget. And we see this a lot because oftentimes the people who are putting together these grant applications are so close to the programs and so connected to the idea that what seems very obvious to them doesn't always translate and seem as obvious to the individuals who might be reviewing your budget on the funding panel, for example. So, so we describe this as sort of an issue of alignment. And this comes up with lots of different grants. Some grants will have a separate project narrative or some sort of written explanation of what's going on, and then they will have a separate budget. What's nice about the APS grant is there is no separate narrative. You just have one budget to kind of tell the story. So that means the alignment should be there, right? Because there shouldn't be any inconsistency because we're only looking at one document. But you want to make sure you're getting extra eyes on what you're putting together so that everyone can see that clearly. So in terms of kind of how do you avoid this problem or strategies you can use, I would say if you do have a description or if you've talked about this project with other people or if you've written it up to describe it to your board, go through and highlight every single sort of action oriented statement in that written description and make sure it is captured somewhere in your budget. Sometimes if you're reading through something you've written or a narrative, simply asking the question, how will we do that can help you draw that connection. And if you don't have anything written up because it's not required for the APS application, that's okay too. Maybe just spend some time going through all of those expenses in high levels of detail because it's very common to miss things. I'll give you an example. Um, let's pretend you are putting together um, a, some sort of event where a piece of art will be unveiled and you're inviting members of the community to come to this event. But before the event happens, you want to have some focus groups, you want to talk to members of the community, you want to sort of get some feedback about what they want to see in this particular piece of art. Well, how will you do that and what will you need? You'll need the space, you'll probably need some food, you'll need some facilitators, maybe you'll need some follow-up actions, right? So all of those things should be showing up in the budget somewhere. So give yourself an 
enough time in breathing room to really slow down and make sure that alignment between what you want to do and what's actually being captured in your budget is there. The third problem that often comes up has to do with reasonable expenses. And this can be an ongoing issue for a couple of reasons. Number one, if there's alignment issues happening with your budget, you might forget about some expenses and need to squeeze them in somewhere later. But also you might be in the habit of trying to do a lot with very little. That's sort of the hallmark of an arts organization, right? We make every dollar stretch as far as possible. But I wanna make sure we're clear and you are looking at your own budget critically to ensure that you are capturing the expenses that are reasonable to execute the goal of your project, right? You do not have to do more with less, right? So if that means adjusting the project to fit within the parameters of the funding opportunity, that's okay. We wanna make sure the expenses are reasonable to accomplish what you want to accomplish as part of your project. So what should you do? Review the expenses. Definitely go through them again slowly, see if you've forgotten anything and see if they really are reasonable. And at this point, I would bring in someone from your team. You might be a team of one. And if that's the case, you know where you're maybe cutting some corners expense wise. But if you're a team of additional people, whether they are artists or volunteers or other members of your organization, they might have insights about where the expenses always feel too tight. And if they have those insights, this is a good moment maybe to reset the expenses within your project budget to really capture the reality of what things cost. I would say that's also particularly important this year when there are probably additional expenses you may not have considered in previous years. These could be extra cleaning supplies or extra hand sanitizers or personal protective equipment you might be purchasing for your team. So, so stay in touch with those individuals that are going to be involved with the project and get their feedback as well. It's also probably a good idea to look back at previous project budgets and then the actual expenses you had for those projects. Because it's very possible that you continue to budget, say $500 to rent space, but it always ends up being $550 or $575. So if you look bad, back at your previous reports of budget to actual expenses, and you notice your actual expenses are consistently higher than what you budget, it's probably time to reset the budget a little bit to capture what really is a reasonable expense. So those are our three kind of upfront things to make sure you are checking in with at the very beginning of putting together your project budget. Are you eligible? Are you following the rules? Are the expenses eligible? And does your project align with the objectives? All those things we want to be as clear as possible within the budget. We wanna make sure the budget is capturing everything that you're wanting to do with your project and it is really aligned with what you will need to do to accomplish the budget. And we wanna make sure those expenses are reasonable. All of these things can cause problems from the very beginning. So we wanna get them out of the way early on. Now that we've got that out of the way, we want to move into some key words and definitions that come up in funding reports with some regularity. These terms are often unfamiliar for a lot of organizations, and so we want to spend some time clarifying them right now. The first word I'd like to define is eligible expense. This is an expense that you are allowed to fund with a particular grant. It is eligible for funding by that grant. And I will say every grant and every funder may define eligible expenses differently. So it makes sense to spend some time reviewing what one particular funder and one particular grant consider eligible. For purposes of APS, the eligible expenses are listed here. They are salaries, administrative fees, artistic fees, staff development and training, space and equipment rental, capital equipment expenditures, 
assuming it's integral to the project, up to $500 is the cap for that eligible expense, production costs and promotional costs. There are a lot of different categories there. So spend some time making sure what you need is captured and eligible. When someone registered, they raised the question, does my income have to match expenses for this particular grant? What if I want a cushion, which is a very reasonable position to be in, especially this year? And my answer would be definitely check the requirements for whatever grant you are applying for. Most grants do require that your budgeted income match your budgeted expenses, right? We would want to see the project essentially break even. You are anticipating you will raise as much income as you will need to fund the expenses from the budget perspective. Now, what might happen throughout the course of the budget could be different, right? So your actual results might be different. But from the beginning, most funders, including APS, require you to show equal amounts of income and expenses. And I will remind you that there are also ineligible expenses uh, as part of the APS program. And so using any of these funds to build up your organization's cash reserves wouldn't be permitted, for example. But I will say as well, a budget includes some inherent uncertainty about the future. So I would say document what you think the expenses will be, but it's probably okay if you round them up a little bit. If you know that space rental will cost you $297, round it up to 300 or so to give yourself a little bit of a cushion. And of course, as you're going through these projects, if there are expenses that are kind of flexible, meaning you could expand them or contract them depending on kind of what unfolds with the project, those expenses are good to save for as late as possible because playing with the timing of those expenses gives you some inherent flexibility with what you can spend to keep your project budget on track. I mentioned ineligible expenses, and of course, uh, there are plenty. I've highlighted a few of them here on the screen. The full list uh, is on the IAC's website, but an ineligible expense is one that you cannot use grant dollars to fund. And again, this varies based on the grant and based on the funder. For APS in particular, cash reserves, deficit reduction, and deficit elimination are ineligible expenses. So keep that in mind as you are planning this particular project budget. You also may not use uh, grant dollars for this program to fund events in private dwellings, projects outside of the state of Indiana, or fundraising activities, or activities that are only for fundraising. Also, you have to make sure expenses occur within the grant period. So again, this is a partial list, but you want to make sure as you're putting together this budget, you are reviewing it with eyes about ineligible expenses, because you cannot use IAC or APS grant dollars to fund any of those ineligible expenses. Another question came in from the registration process that said, some projects run a deficit, some try to break even, others turn a profit that can then help the organization in the future. What does that look like? Is, our, is one of those scenarios better or worse? And I would say it depends because every funder is different, but in my experience, break even budgets are really what funders are looking for, um, especially in the context of some of those ineligible expenses, right? If you are put, putting together a project budget that you um, expect will cost $4,000 and your ask is for $5,000 of income with the intention of building up a $1,000 cash reserve, that is ineligible or that reserve contribution is an ineligible expense. So that would fall outside of the parameters of the grant and you would likely be rejected for, with that particular application. So definitely get to know the funder, understand what the rules and requirements are and know that most funders want to see a break even budget, one that has equal amounts of income and expenses for a project.
I will also say, if you are talking about an individual donor, maybe you have someone on your board with a background in business or entrepreneurship, that person might be very excited to see a project budget that has some sort of surplus that the organization could then use. A conversation you might have with an individual donor is very different from a conversation you might have with a grant funder. So keep in mind that different funders and different donors may have different priorities and you can adjust accordingly. When it comes to eligible expenses, um, if we were to sort of tighten this up and tie it with a bow, uh, the key point is to review the guidelines carefully. And as I mentioned, review them at the beginning so you know what you're gonna put into the budget, but then also review them at the end to double check yourself, right? Because you don't want to accidentally include something that would make your application ineligible. And every grant and every funder can have different eligibility rules, which means you need to spend some time on this for every application. The next word I want to spend some time on is match. A match is income from a project from another source that would equal one funder's contribution. So for example, let's pretend you're putting together a $10,000 project. Your request from the IAC for this grant is $5,000 and you would match that $5,000 with $5,000 from another source. In this case, from ticket sales. A match requirement is pretty common for a number of grants. So it's something you should be familiar with. And the idea is basically you are trying to match dollars from one source with dollars from another source. I do want to be very, very clear though, for fiscal year 2022, there is no APS match requirement. That is a current year change, so make sure you are aware there is no APS match requirement for this particular cycle. And make sure if all of the funding for your project is coming from IAC, right, so you are not bringing in any additional income for your project, then all of your expenses have to be eligible. Sometimes uh, organizations ask, why do we bother with this match? Um, and the answer is, there are lots of reasons, but it's a really good way to show investment from others within the community for something, right? So a project is not reliant on a single funder. It includes support from a variety of sources, which is an indication of additional support for the project. And matches can come from lots of different sources. You can run a special campaign. You can solicit individual dollars. Uh, in some cases, you can also use existing unrestricted dollars you may have. You can think about some in-kind contributions to contribute to the match. We'll talk about in-kind more in a moment. But you can also think about earned income as well. So for example, on the previous slide, we saw the match was coming from ticket sales, which is perfectly fine. Again, APS this year does not require a match. So don't lose sleep over that for this particular cycle, but know that a match shows investment in a particular project by a variety of sources. I mentioned in-kind, now it's time to jump into in-kind. In-kind really throws people off often because it's, it's a strange kind of concept. But an in-kind contribution is a donation or contribution of goods or services that are donated to the project by someone other than the organization. And that other than the organization or other than the applicant part is an important part of this definition. Some funders might say, oh, it's any goods and services donated by anyone. But for purposes of APS and IAC, in kind has to come from someone other than the applicant or other than the organization. And something in kind is something that you give in its own kind rather than in cash, right? So let's pretend um, I really am supportive of a particular project that an organization I love is doing. I could make a $1,000 contribution to that organization and that would be lovely. That's a cash contribution. 
But what if I know that um, all the art supplies I have in my spare bedroom could be used for that project? If I donate $1,000 worth of art supplies, that is an in-kind donation because I'm donating the kind of things they need, the art supplies, right? So when we think of in-kind, we think of something that's a good or a service that's donated that's not actually money. And of course, if it's not actually money, one of the big questions then becomes, how do we value what that in-kind contribution is. So a question that came in, two of them actually, the first one said, how do you show monetary values for potential in-kinds from people to spaces? And then the second question was, what is the allowable or acceptable or legal rate per hour for each in-kind contribution? And I will say, when we think about valuing something in kind, we're looking for a verifiable fair market value which means essentially what would you spend on this if you had to pay for it? So my suggestion would be ask the donor, ask the donor or the provider what they would normally charge and then use that amount. And ideally you're documenting that conversation with them in some way. So for example, let's pretend I am uh, hosting a small theater production and the um, large airplane hanger down the road from me has offered to provide the space as an in-kind donation. I would say, thank you very much. I appreciate that. What would you normally charge me to use this? And they might say, well, we'd normally charge you $800. And I say, thank you very much. Could I record the value of your contribution at $800? And they'd say, sure. I can have them send me an invoice for that showing the donation. I can have some correspondence via email with them to, court, to confirm that, or I could ask them to fill out a form that captures that information as well. This is an example of an in-kind contribution report. This is from the NEA and it's listed on the IAC's website, and it essentially captures what was donated, what's a description of it, who donated it, who the donor is, and then what's the approximate value of what was provided. So this is an important documentation tool. You do not have to use this form, but if you find it easy to simply share this with the donor and ask them to document the value of the in-kind contribution, that is perfectly fine. This can be very useful if someone is donating services as well. So let's pretend you are running that theater production in the airplane hangar and you approach a well-known local director to direct the production and they say, I'd be honored to, I'd like to donate my services as a director. And you say, thank you so much. That's incredibly generous. What is the value of that? Or would you consider filling out this form to give me a sense of the real value of the services you're donating. And then the director could place their own value on what they're contributing. So I hope that helps clear up some of the keywords. Uh, eligible expenses clearly defined on the APS page for this particular grant. Match can be a little tricky, not required for this cycle, but we're looking for funds from another source to match dollars we're raising from one funder. And then in kind is the goods or services donated from someone that is not you, right, to contribute to a particular project and valuing those by the donor and asking for their input to value them and documenting that conversation is a good practice to have. So now that we've talked about a few kind of rules and objectives to keep in mind from the beginning, we've cleared up some vocabulary, now it's time to move into some real strategies or best practices when it comes to building a budget. I like to define a budget for all purposes, but specifically for these project budgets as a financial plan for allocating resources. And there are three parts to that definition. There's the plan. So what you think you're going to do aligned with the objectives of the funder and consistent with everything you need. The allocation part is the spending part. What are you going to spend money on? What are the expense categories and are they reasonable? 
And then the resources part is the income part. Where are you getting the funds from to spend to execute your plan or idea? And when we think about it this way, the budget really is basically a description of the idea using numbers instead of words. And I think that's maybe a helpful way, or I hope it's a helpful way to think about putting your budget together. So as we think about these best practices, I wanted to share a number of questions that were submitted as part of the registration process, but also think about some of the barriers that organizations face in putting these project budgets together and connect those to some best practices so that you would have actionable strategies and tactics you could do following this workshop. So the first barrier is that sometimes you don't know what things are going to cost. And in fact, one question that came in was, how should I factor in space costs for rehearsals or production? And that is a barrier, right? Sometimes you just don't know. So my advice or my suggestion for the actions to take are to make an informed guess. Definitely document your thinking about the informed guests because you won't necessarily remember later why you thought costumes were going to cost $750 when they ended up costing $1,500 or something like that. So make an informed guess and document your thinking. And then I would also go back through really slowly and make sure you were listing all of those expenses and capturing amounts for them. Even if you think, oh, I already have those supplies, I won't need to do that, right? Go ahead and include it in your budget, at least at the beginning, so you make sure you're really capturing the true cost of what you're doing. And then know where your flexibility is within the budget, whether that is a timing issue. So if there are some expenses you can save for later in the project and maybe scale them back as needed, or if you know there's some flexibility in anticipating something will cost maybe between $500 and $1,000, right? And you know you could pull back to the lower end of that range if necessary. Knowing where your flexibility is within the budget gives you some protection against not knowing exactly what things might cost in the future. And I would also encourage you to be very open with those around you about your budget because it's amazing how many things might be accidentally forgotten. And when our budgets are so tight as they are in arts world, a forgotten expense can really be problematic to the project overall. So get as many voices and as many eyes on the budget as possible to really build up an accurate representation of what things probably will cost based on the best information you have. And then make some notes to yourself to remember why you thought what you thought. I have an example here of an APS budget from a previous cycle. You can see uh, this definitely has matching income and expenses. As we mentioned, that's a requirement for the APS grant. We see the IAC grant request here is $5,000 with some additional contributions from other outside sources. And then for this particular project, the organization is planning on artistic fees, audio and lighting, publicity, and space rental. And this is perfectly fine. I would probably like to see a little bit more detail here so that I could better understand what those artistic fees were and what was going into the audio and lighting and what sort of publicity they were envisioning. But this is perfectly fine in terms of making best guesses about what you might spend in the future. And I imagine the organization that submitted this probably had lots of notes to themselves that said something like, okay, artistic fees are based on this many number of performers at this particular rate, right? And so they had additional notes to themselves that were helping to jog their memory about what some of those costs might be. And speaking of what some of those costs might be, 
One of the other big barriers is simply not knowing what to pay artists because there is a huge range of what is acceptable in the arts. And in fact, one of the questions that came in from someone was asking for insight on determining artist fees in terms of these grant budgets. Um, then this person shared that some vendors and private contractors have set rates that are very clear to document, but artist fees tend to be less consistent and maybe even more flexible. So the question is, how do you like to see this laid out in a realistic and fair way? And I love that this person called out realistic and fair, because I think those are important parts to consider about what we are choosing to pay artists as part of these project budgets. So my suggestion would be do your research. And I am probably not the first person to say that, but sometimes we say do your research without actually connecting that to an action step. So what I mean by that is find out through your industry group. Uh, if you're a theater, maybe that is TCG. Um, if you are a literary organization, maybe it's the Writers Guild, right? Find an industry group with respect to your specific creative practice that you trust and look for some guidance from them. If your organization is subject to any union or guild guidance, obviously definitely make sure you're paying attention to that. Or even if you're not, you can still use that as some additional research to inform what might be reasonable. And if you have particular geographic information for your state or your city, maybe through your local arts council, you can lean into that information as well. I'd also direct you to this particular resource, um, wageforwork.com. This is a really interesting resource that I would encourage you to play around with. Um, this has some suggested information about what uh, wages, reasonable compensation for artists of various disciplines could be. And it also summarizes information from a variety of organizations that have submitted their own information to this particular website. Um, so you'll see it is a bright yellow color when you visit this website. So, you know, give yourself a moment to get used to that bright yellow color. And as you navigate around, you can click on the name of different organizations. They're arranged vertically and then see different summary information popping up. So if you know of an organization that is in your particular discipline or in your area and they're showing up there, this can help inform some of what you're looking at. So uh, you'll also see an acronym they use, T-A-O-E. On this particular website, that stands for Total Annual Operating Expenses, which I also think is really helpful. So in addition to presenting dollar figures, they also show the percentage of operating expenses, which means if you are a very large or a very small organization, the dollar figure might not make sense, but the percentage might help you figure out what might be reasonable in your particular organization. So I would not use this as sort of an absolute guide you must follow, but as you're doing your research, if you're pulling information from industry groups and your local arts council and also this website and maybe other peer organizations that you can get some information from, pretty soon you'll have a coherent picture of the rates that make sense for you and your organization. I mentioned checking with peers. If you have um, a local organization that focuses on tourism or experiences, they may have some really good data. And if you are fortunate enough to have an active local arts council, they could also be very helpful as well. If you're not, maybe you know of a nearby arts council uh, that also might have some helpful information to share. And it's worth pointing out that as you're gathering this information, right, which is important to do, it's also important to step back and say, okay, does this make sense for my organization? Does this particular rate capture the experience of someone I'm engaging, right? Because someone with considerably more experience should and could command a higher honorarium or a higher level of compensation. So you can gather the research and then adjust for experience if that's part of what you're adjusting for.
You should also think about kind of what you are asking the individual artists to do. If you are asking them to include quite a bit of travel or provide their own supplies or, or provide their own personal protective equipment, for example, uh, you can also include those things in a stipend or an honorarium. So we start with the research, we get a sense of what's reasonable, and then we kind of gut check and adjust based on what we know to be true about our organization and the particular project. I would also say sort of in conclusion, uh, I believe very, very strongly in paying artists and compensating individuals for their work. And you'll remember that is a key part of this particular grant. So paying artists is absolutely crucial. And you might decide that that's an opportunity to express your own organizational values. And that might even be something worth formalizing in some sort of policy that says we are an organization that always pays artists some amount of money or something like that. So I think it's an interesting way to use the budget to start a conversation about values and priorities. And if you can have that conversation at the board level and use it as an opportunity to raise additional dollars that then go back to the creative individuals you serve, that's probably a good thing. Here's another example of a budget, and this one breaks out in a beautiful amount of detail what the artists are being paid, and that's why I wanted to include it at this particular moment. You'll see also uh, this has matching income and expenses, as we would expect from the APS project budget, and this particular organization is counting on earned income from ticket sales, plus the APS grant, plus some other philanthropic support. In a perfect world, I might like to see maybe who that is, but that might not be reasonable. Maybe this is uh, board members or individual donors, or maybe it's other potential grants the organization is trying to raise. Um, so, you know, if they know what it's going to be, they could certainly list it, but they absolutely don't have to. On the expense side, we have artist fees, and we see that broken down into these different amounts. We have youth actors, adult actors, director, playwrights. That's a helpful level of detail to provide. We also have project staff and personnel, again, broken out. And then some supplies, materials, costumes, different rentals, all of which add up to paint the picture of what this particular project is going to be. The third barrier that comes up is often that you're not quite sure how much information to share. And sometimes this goes in two different directions. Some organizations want to share everything and as much detail as humanly possible to avoid any questions. And then other organizations want to be as vague as possible so that they can preserve as much flexibility if things don't go according to plan. My advice would be to aim right for the middle. You want to share enough information so that the vision and the project is clear and the funder has confidence in your ability to do what you say you are going to do. But there probably is a point where you are sharing too much information that's not really adding value to your particular application. One question a little bit related to this that came in said, please explain what's wanted in the grant application that states provide any additional information about your financial materials. And this is one of those sections where you can provide as much additional information as you think would be helpful or you don't have to. In this field, I think you have 10,000 characters to play with, which could be a lot of text. So if you were putting together a budget that looked something like this one, maybe you wanted to add an asterisk or something next to artist fees, and then in that additional information section, explain them in even more detail than what you've provided. And that would be okay. Or maybe under other philanthropic support, you would like to add an additional note about that. This additional field is really just for you to provide additional information to help explain and clarify different things that might come up. 
And you might not know exactly what will come up, but if you've shared your budget with some other individuals and gotten feedback from on it, you might have some good ideas about things you can change or things that might need a little bit more explanation. In terms of what to do, other than sharing your budget with other individuals for feedback, this could be a really good moment to reach out to the program's primary contact, right? So this would be maybe the regional partner or someone that you would like to share additional information with and maybe get their feedback, right? Or it could just be an extra set of eyes from someone on your team or your board to review what you've included. The key takeaway is that you want to tell the story clearly and concisely with enough information for the funder to have total confidence in your ability to execute this project, right? And that might mean you need extra notes for yourself, but you might say, you know what, the funder doesn't need this an additional information. They just need what I've put within this budget or within the additional space. And it might not be a separate field, but it's the additional space where you can provide additional clarifying information that could be helpful. Here's another example of a budget that was submitted. Um, this one does show some in-kind contributions. And I want to note that the cash income amount here totals the cash expenses. We're still showing a break-even budget because this in-kind amount is essentially doubling as something coming in, a donation of time or materials, and then something going out, the use of that time or materials, right? So in this particular budget, the IAC grant request is $3,000. We have some earned income projected for class fees. We're anticipating a sliding scale scholarship option for 20 different participants. And the total cash income for the project is anticipated to be $4,600. We're going to spend money on artist fees, consulting partner fees, project managers, some marketing. You'll notice here this organization has explained what kind of marketing they're anticipating, renting a facility, some insurance, which I personally like to see, and then accommodations as well. So this is just another great example of the level of detail that could be very helpful and the amount of information you may want to include. The next barrier that comes up is the fact that this might be due tomorrow. We didn't have a specific question related to this one to share from someone who registered, but sometimes, especially when organizational leaders are doing a lot of different things, and especially during a time of uncertainty where you might be investigating various emergency grant relief options, sometimes these deadlines can sneak up on you and that is okay. What I'd like to remind you is you do not have to apply for every single grant if you feel like it's not a good use of your time. Sometimes we see organizations chasing after grants. There's an application due, so we have to put something together and figure out what we could possibly spend this money on. And that just leads to exhaustion and burnout. So I'd encourage you to avoid that sort of panic fundraising or grant writing. And if you've been in the business for a while, you know that the grant cycle is often pretty consistent for different funders. That doesn't mean everything comes up at the exact same time, but you start to kind of notice a rhythm with different funders, whether it's foundations, corporations, governmental entities, there are some predictable patterns to when different grants tend to be due. So start paying attention to that rhythm and keep a calendar. There is no reason you have to put something together just because a grant is due. You want to make sure you're putting your energy towards putting together a really strong proposal that does make sense and move your organization toward its goals and its bigger strategic objectives. And of course, if you are ongoingly engaging with your community and having conversations with different individuals and organizations and your community members and those you serve, there's a good chance that you will have sort of a 
almost like a parking lot of good ideas that are waiting for their time. And so this is another opportunity where you can continue to just kind of pay attention to what some of those potential good ideas and projects might be. And then when a funding opportunity does present itself and the time is right, then you can make the magic happen and put together a really strong proposal for that particular application. But that doesn't mean you need to lose sleep chasing after every single grant deadline, because that's probably not a great use of your time. We know in normal years, budgeting includes some uncertainty, and we also know this is not a normal year. So a barrier that some people run into is the fact that things might change or the project might not go according to plan. It is hard to budget with so much unknown. So what if something changes? And I would say, go back to what you plan to do, sort of those objectives of the project, your big picture goals for your organization, and the expenses that you think are reasonable. Making your best guess based on research that you have found, and then adjusting for things you know to be true about your particular project. And as you are putting this together, and then especially after the project begins, embrace malleability and flexibility. That's a good attitude to have all of the time, and it's especially good during uncertain times. Because ultimately, if you have a clear picture of what the overall goal of the project and the overall goal of your organization is, then you can continue moving towards that goal, even if the path meanders a little bit more than you thought it might. The details can change a little bit without really causing major problems, right? And the IAC has gone above and beyond this year in providing flexibility to organizations and providing support for changes in timelines or ways of delivering art. If something was contemplated to be an in-person event and then it ended up being virtual, that's okay, right? And the funder, IAC in particular, can work with you on that. In non-pandemic times, if there is a major change to what you have proposed, this again is a really good time to contact the person responsible for the funding to understand what your options are. Again, maintaining that open line of communication with your do donors is a really good idea. So those are the barriers and some strategic solutions we contemplated uh, to think about incorporating some best practices into overcoming those barriers. I'll remind you that the budget is a financial plan for allocating your resources, the planning part, the spending part, what are you going to spend money on, and the resources part, where is it going to come from? It's basically your vision of the project with some words and numbers instead of in a paragraph. I would definitely encourage you to keep track of what you are doing with respect to your project grants and really embrace whatever organizational system works for you. Maybe it's a spreadsheet, maybe it is a time management app or software tool, maybe it's a calendar, whatever works for you is probably a really good thing to incorporate into your practice of budgeting and then lean into the other humans around you that can help review the information you are putting forward. We have a recap here of some of the best practices that you saw as action items throughout this last final section. I'd encourage you to review these uh, at your leisure uh, if you need a little bit of a refresher. Uh, and I will sort of pull us back here to remind us what we talked about. Uh, the first section was talking about sort of the why of going into this budgeting process, right? Thinking about the rules and the eligibility of certain expenses, the objectives of the grant program and how your idea aligns with it, making sure all the expenses are reasonable and you're including a complete vision in the budget you're putting together. 
The second section went through some key vocabulary words that come up for a lot of different funders. What expenses are eligible? What does a match mean? And how does it affect the grant? And then lastly, what is in-kind? And what are some examples of both in-kind services or goods, and then also valuing those in-kind services and goods? And then in part three, when we talked about the strategies, we identified five different barriers and some best practices for overcoming those various barriers. I will pause at this time and invite um, a page from the IAC to come back to see if there are any questions that may have come up uh, during the presentation. I, we just had one and that was with regard to um, the IRS or state mileage rate and what, how to include that in the budget, which I think is a really valuable question. Um, for us with the Arts Commission, you know, we tend to recommend that the mileage be the state rate of 0.39 cents per mile. But we also recognize that artists can be used to having the uh, IRS rate, which it could be around 54 cents a mile while you're budgeting, it could be easier to factor in a little bit higher because unless you absolutely know what the artist wants, you could maybe compensate into their stipend if necessary, you could fold it all into their honoraria. Um, sort of um, think about the supplies, thinking about the mileage and thinking about their stipend um, all together. Um, so kind of going along with, with Elaine's original suggestion. Other than that, uh, we don't have any questions beyond the IRS one, which is great. That means you just covered everything, right? <laughs> Perhaps. I like what you just shared about the mileage page. And, and I would imagine if I were putting together a budget and let's say I wanted to give an artist an honorarium of $500, but I knew the artist was driving, say, 50 miles from their home to the project site and then 50 miles back, that might be 100 miles round trip. And so I might include an extra $39 on top of their honorarium using the Indiana rate. So $500 plus $39 for mileage reimbursement. And then if they're using their own supplies as well, I might also bump it up to say $550. So thinking holistically about what that total number is using your numbers and your example, I think is really helpful. Perfect, even better. <laughs> Great suggestion. Thank you, Elaine. You are so welcome. Um, I will sort of bring all the pieces together. Uh, interrupt me if there are more questions that come okay. in, um, including from uh, our friends who are watching via YouTube or the other live stream. Um, but our recap is you know, to highlight some best practices for creating an arts project budget, specifically for APS, although many of these things would apply to other budgets you're contemplating creating. We definitely reviewed expense eligibility and the match requirements. I would encourage you to spend some time on the APS page of the IAC's website to really review all of those definitions in detail. They are easy to find and good to spend some time on. And then of course, the budget is your opportunity to connect the expenses and your values with the overall goal of the project. So to the extent that that is coming through in what you are describing, your budget will be in really good shape. It was such a pleasure spending some time with you this afternoon. Huge thanks to the Indiana Arts Commission for hosting these conversations and for all they do in support of the arts. And Paige, I will turn it back over to you to close us out. Okay, great. Thank you, Elaine. Um, I, I did get uh, notified by one of the IAC staff that at the beginning of YouTube, when we were streaming, the Q&A wasn't available. So if they refresh their browser, that will populate. Um, we'll keep it live for just a little bit longer, um, just in case somebody does have questions. Um, but we can 
stop recording, I think if, if that's not necessary at this point. Um, I, for everybody who doesn't have questions and ready to go, thank you so much for participating today. I'm sure this was beneficial to you. I know having started working on budgets years ago, starting with the arts project support, that in kind can be a big mystery and all of this can be a big mystery. So thank you, Elaine, for helping us through that today. Really appreciate your time, your energy, your clarity and your kindness. Thank you, everybody.